following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. Week six of college football was a fun one. We're going to talk about the Red River Showdown and a few other games that went on this past weekend. A lot of fun in college football. We're also going to touch up and and bring up our power rankings. It's finally past week six, which means that it's finally time when we can see the separation between teams. So we're going to talk about our our, uh, power rankings for college football through week six. And then we're also going to jump into a little bit of NFL and try to recap a little bit of what went on in the NFL world. It was a lot of fun throughout all of football this past weekend. We're going to talk about all of this and so much more today on Rising to the Occasion. Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of Rising to the Occasion. We're so happy to have you guys along with us for another ride, another week of recapping a lot of games that went on the past week, uh, this past weekend. And of course, for me, I'm still feeling a little bit of a buzz, guys. I'm I'm, I'm feeling high on the on the victory. I'm enjoying it. Uh, and we've got a bye week this week, so I get to just sit back and enjoy everybody else battling it out this weekend. Because I'm telling you what, this was a perfect weekend for a bye weekend because. I had way too much stress all day Saturday, the whole game, an outstanding game. But we're going to get to that. But before we do, got to bring up a, a an amazing part of this show, and it is getting you guys into sports betting. Because if you were a sports fan, sports betting is, is growing in popularity. It really is. It's been growing a lot lately, especially here in America. And if you are a college football fan or a hockey fan or you know an nfl fan basketball fan whatever the case may be putting a little wager in on the game makes it a little bit more fun it gets you into the game it gets you a little bit more excitement a little bit more interesting for you you have to know your limits we don't we don't condone any kind of irresponsible betting but we condone having fun with the game and going in on the game and and just trying to get yourself included in on the action and a great way to do that is by sports betting but i've heard from a lot of people they ask me they're like hey josh I don't really know what sports books to get started on. I don't really know where to jump in at. And we've made it very easy for everyone who is in that boat. If you're looking for a sports book or you want to know what sports books are available in your area, we've made it super simple. You go to rising2.com slash bet. That's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O dot com slash B-E-T. Whenever you go to that, that website, what it does is it brings up all of the sports books, and if you're in, a, in an area that doesn't allow sports books, uh, sports betting on sports books, then it'll even show up different fantasy sites and prop betting sites and stuff like that. And so it's got something for everyone, no matter where you are. You go there, it shows everything that's available in your in your area. It will also show you reviews of those sports books, and it'll rank them from from most favorite to least favorite. And it also automatically gives you the best promotions in the business. So you go there, whenever you click on it, it will automatically give you the best promotions in the business for all sports books that are available in your region. So again, go to rising2.com slash bet. That's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O dot com slash B-E-T. You can check it out there. And guys, it's it's an amazing way for you to find the best sports book for you based on your region. And again, like I said, giving you the most exclusive offer as well. Uh, so go check it out, rising2.com slash bet. Uh, it's, it's been an amazing way for us to find new sports books. Uh, one of my favorites has been FanDuel. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring in my co-hosts for the evening before we get into all the recapping and stuff like that. I'm first going to bring in Jeremy, the man from Sioux City, Iowa. Jeremy, how you doing? And uh, tell everybody what your favorite sports book is. Oh, man. Before I got into sports betting, because I was never really big on the sports betting, but I started off with getting into DraftKings, and it was something really simple for a beginner like myself. But once I got into sports betting, I got over to what you have been talking about. And it's honestly becoming my new favorite now just because you have such a variety of what you can pick. And plus, like you said, for the limitations compared to like DraftKings, you can only bet in certain states. But for a couple of my friends who were in that kind of a – kind of in that little bit of a pickle, they have the opportunity to go on and actually do some sports betting. So that was my big 
my big new fond of, but outside of sports betting and just in general, I'm doing pretty good. Had a really fun weekend, got to watch a lot of college football, then got the chance to watch the Red River rivalry with you for a little bit before I made my trip up to Mankato, Minnesota. And um, that was a fun weekend. Then got back home, watched some NFL football, got to watch the Cincinnati Bengals and Jamar Chase ball out, baby. Got set a new single game record for receptions at 15, blowing out the other one at 13. Then it was really fun to watch that. And just for overall, this weekend was really fun. And looking up to this weekend, I know we got some really good games coming up this week. And I'm just looking forward to this weekend. Then next week, obviously, you and I make the trip down to Norman. So that's going to be one thing I get to check off my bucket list for you. This is probably like the millionth time you checked it off your bucket list. But outside of that, I'm ready to talk some sports with everybody and let's get rolling with it. Heck yeah. And and I actually just looked up uh, DraftKings for you on, on Rising2.com slash DraftKings. Uh, because you can do that with DraftKings. Uh, you go over there. If you just go to rising2.com slash bet, you'll find the same thing too. But it looks like in Iowa right now, if you sign up today uh, and bet $5, you get $200 plus $150 in bonus bets right now. That is an amazing Ooh. deal. So uh, for everyone that's interested, that one looks like a very good deal. And I wish I could take it up on it, but I already have an account, so I can't take that offer. But the man from Mobile, Alabama, Blake, how you doing, man? What is up, fellas? <laughs> Man, Jeremy gets me on that every time. Uh, I'm I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, got my son over here. He's he's riding through me uh, through with me on this one, uh, and and we're gonna try to make it and talk some college football with you boys. And uh, what a weekend it was, man! A lot of great games. The Red River rivalry shootout, whatever you want to call it. What an ending to that one! Uh, just a heck of a game, like it always is. Uh, my Auburn Tigers were on a bye week, so I was I was stress free this weekend. Uh, Alabama and Texas A and M, what a game that was! Uh, just just all just all over the country, man. USC going to three overtimes, uh, that was a head scratcher. But uh, man, uh, I'm ready to get into it and talk all about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I do apologize. I I said showdown. That was just because I was thinking showdown in my head. It wasn't because I was trying to be politically correct. Uh, I, I don't really care what you call it personally. Uh, I know a lot of a lot of guys. They they want to stick to one way. I grew up on Red River rivalry. That's what I knew knew it as. The shootout came later, whenever it was just two offenses going at it. But guys, let's go ahead and jump into that one because obviously I've been excited to talk about this one all weekend long. I was extremely yeah, happy with the way the Sooners popped up and, and, and showed up on, in that game. But I, I do want to stop for a minute and just just call out everyone who is saying that Texas just wasn't on their A game. Texas just didn't look good. I don't want to hear that anymore because the truth is Oklahoma showed up and gave it an A minus effort. I don't. I think there was room for improvement from Oklahoma. Uh, there was there was obviously some things. You know, you look at special teams. The the blocked punt. I called that immediately as soon as they lined up. Nobody was picking up. Everyone was still lined up like it was a regular punt. Nobody tried to line up in a, a punt block formation, anything like that. Uh, so there were some special teams issues there. Uh, Jalil Farouk uh, pitching it sort of forward. I hate that ruling because he pitched it behind him, but the ball traveled forward. So I get it. Um, stuff like that. There, there was there was some miscues here and there. There were some dropped passes that should have been caught. Uh, but guys turned it on when they needed to. And so first off, I'm going to start off with the man, the myth, the legend, the, the dude that that carried the entire team on his back, and that is Dylan Gabriel. Uh, the, the dude threw for 285 yards on 60% and threw a touchdown. But on top of that, he ran for another 113 yards on 14 mm-hmm. carries and another touchdown oh. fr- on the ground. So that the dude was just on fire. I've been talking about this guy since last year. Everyone criticized him last year. I said, I see a lot of potential in this guy. I see this guy stepping in next year and having a phenomenal year. And everyone said, uh, you know, I, I forget who it was. I heard I heard uh, several people, and I should have taken receipts so I can call them out, uh, saying that they see Dylan Gabriel sitting on the bench by the time the Red River rivalry comes up um, because Jackson Darnold's in town. But this dude did not back down. He went out there, and, and he had a chip on his shoulder. He didn't get to play in this game because he had a cheap shot on him, uh, the, the game against TCU, and, and his team lost because he wasn't in the game. Uh, that, that was a huge part of it last year. Uh, and so Dylan Gabriel showing up, that was huge. Jaleel Farouk looked phenomenal. Uh, and then, of course, Nick Anderson with the last last 15 seconds in the game catches the touchdown in the back of the end zone. Just a phenomenal showing by, by the Sooners. I, I wasn't super excited about this game in the sense that I thought 
we're going to come up and we're going to we're going to look good, but we're going to give it away late and it's going to be a last last minute Texas comeback. When we scored that touchdown, it felt like there's no way that the Texas can't come back. Uh, and so that was that was an amazing feeling to see that to see. I want to I want to I want to note too. I don't know if you guys noticed that that last drive, no timeouts left. If you don't know, if you didn't watch it, I don't know what you were doing. Um, but that last drive, no timeouts left. You have to get down the field fast, and you have to be smart with the ball. And Texas was covering the outsides. A huge hat off to, to Dylan Gabriel once again. And the offensive line did phenomenal for him all game long. Uh, he was able to connect with with Drake Stoops. They were going in the middle of the field, which is gutsy, but it was smart the way that they did it. Get a first down in the last two minutes, it stops the clock. And so get a first down, stop the clock enough to hurry up and just kill them with your speed. And Oklahoma did, it did an, an amazing job with it. Uh, and they got down there. They did the right thing. And Dylan Gabriel evading evading. The, the the pressure nonstop, fighting through a pretty nasty little cut on his pinky on his it was on his right hand, mm. uh, but just going down there and performing that way. And the reason why that last hail mary didn't connect, I don't know if you if anyone caught it because I didn't hear anybody talking about it, was because mm. and I, as soon as as soon as it was let go, I knew it wasn't going anywhere. Texas was really smart because Oklahoma dropped everybody back into the end zone. You're not getting into the end zone. We're gonna p- keep everything in front of us. Not a bad tactic, but. Texas is uh, what, what Quinn Ewers was trying to do was connect to a guy before the end zone and let him power it in. Uh, he, he was trying that and there was somebody, I, I didn't see who it was, um, but one of the defenders got to Quinn Ewers and was able to hit him as he threw it, hung up in the air too long and Oklahoma was able to make a play on the ball. Uh, just, I was extremely ecstatic about this guys. Uh, and Blake, th- I feel like this win was a, the biggest win for, uh, for Brent Venables. And yep. it was a win that capitalizes on on what he's been doing this year. It capitalizes on his defensive improvement, uh, and I think it's the win that Oklahoma, as a program, needed because even with the mistakes, even with the things that went wrong in this game, and on paper, Oklahoma may not have won this game, but the fact that you're able to, to capitalize on Texas's mistakes, win the turnover game, uh, and, and just put all kinds of pressure on Quinn Ewers. Uh, it, it, I think this win was necessary for Oklahoma because it shows that Oklahoma is for real right now. And I, I, like I said, I think Oklahoma genuinely had a very good game. And I don't think Texas played bad. I think Texas played very good. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just Oklahoma outperformed. Josh, I'll, I'll be straight up honest with you. They're going to rematch in the Big 12 title game. I, I think so. Mm-hmm. And Oklahoma, I, I have to give all the credit in the world to Brett Venables Uh, because I've kept telling you, Josh, that Oklahoma hired the man for a reason. Uh, You know, he used to have that Oklahoma defense back in the day. Uh, He had them flying around, and and that's what you saw Saturday. You know, yeah, they they gave up 30 points, uh, but they forced three turnovers. All right, and the biggest thing with me for Oklahoma is the tackling in open field, out in open space. I think Oklahoma has improved so much in that aspect of the game. I, I just – it's 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 completely different, man. Like when when Lincoln was there and Grinch and, and you just had missed tackles and now you see it out at USC, just the wide – just wide open, uh, your DBs and, and linebackers just missing out in open space, wide open tackles, and, uh, and that allows for big gains to pop off. But this defense forcing three turnovers and and putting Quinn Ewers under pressure. Look, he still had a heck of a game, right? He did. Quinn was he was dealing, he was but but you put the pressure on him, and you forced him into a couple mistakes, and uh, and you forced three turnovers. And and Oklahoma's playing defense. You can criticize them all they want to uh, for for the game at Cincinnati and say, oh well, they didn't beat Cincinnati by this and everything. But uh, when it when it comes to the big time showdown, uh, they were ready for it, Josh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and one thing to Quinn Ewers, like you said, Quinn Ewers had a very good game. Uh, he he did. He played very well. He started off very slow. And I'm going to be honest. I, when you watch those two interceptions, I don't think he made a terrible decision. First interception, maybe shouldn't have gone there. Uh, wasn't the right pass. Uh, but that was Oklahoma being more aggressive. And that one was a an interception stolen from the receiver. Uh, and so it, it should have been knocked down, but it was stolen. It was the aggression there. And then the second interception to go over to that one, 
that was just an aggressive hit. That was just, I'm trying to knock you out and it pops up in the air and a great awareness on the defense. That's something else you didn't see with Alex Grinch's defense is the awareness, seeing where everything's at on the field. Uh, Jeremy, we, we saw we saw uh, throughout this game, man, uh, it was just Oklahoma being more aggressive and just smash mouth football. Uh, you know, and and I'm surprised there weren't more injuries with as gr- as aggressive as this game was on both sides of the ball. Um, but just a, a a phenomenal showing by by Oklahoma and being able to stand up and win this game. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was like you said, this is the biggest win for Oklahoma right now for confidence boosters for everybody. Like you said, this was easily without a doubt the most aggressive football game I've seen so far this season. If I had to be completely honest with you, but. Outside of Oklahoma, you got to give some respect to Texas, too. And they literally were trying to keep up with the momentum from Oklahoma. You would see, I mean, you would see Oklahoma's defense get a big sack, and then all of a sudden you see Texas come right back at it with a big game play, either having their wideouts just out in the flats to where they can make a nice reception for close to the first down yardage, or even just finding a seam just to get the run game going. But overall, for this kind of a game, that was an unbelievable game to watch. And if you didn't get a chance to watch it, you definitely need to go and watch the game for crying out loud just because the Red River rivalry is the game that you definitely do sincerely want to watch it because that was literally one of the most funnest games I I honestly could say I watched this entire weekend for for both teams. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Josh, I know Oklahoma. What did you guys have, five sacks? Yeah, five sacks. Yeah. Five sacks. Uh, th- you know, that was the biggest thing to me, too. Uh, and, and I mentioned putting the pressure on Quinn Ewers. But Oklahoma, I feel like they've improved so much on getting off the field on third down. Yeah. I, I, I remember – yeah, I they, remember they struggled, when Lincoln- – They struggled at times throughout the game, especially second half. Yeah, uh, and and it was just you know bonehead mistakes here and there, and I think a lot of it was just playing prevent, just trying to keep everything in front of you, and keep them away from it. But but yeah, I agree with you. But would you remember when Alex Grinch was there? Yeah, it, it's like, it, it would be third yeah. and eighteen. It, it, it and, would be and it would be twelve would play drives ball. on them nonstop. And twelve play like, drives. Good job, you stopped them. Now they go up again. And and hats off to Texas, they did really well on fourth down. Uh, apparently there was a, a a a fake a fake punt that went for a first down. Nobody really saw it unless you were in the stadium because ESPN sucks and they can't get their freaking game coverage going. And then you got the whole image on the side of the screen. Figure it out, ESPN. You can't have the biggest game for Oklahoma uh, and Texas, at that matter, at this at this point. Uh, yeah, you, you got all that money, dude. <laughs> Just, oh my goodness, that was frustrating. But uh, when, when I realized Oklahoma's defense is for real was when Texas was first and goal on the one-yard line. Didn't make it in on, on a run play on first down didn't make it in on a run play on second down didn't make it in on a run play on third down a little a little flat flat route out, out to the left or as a kind of a, a screen look look more like didn't make it in and it was just the the tough nose defense i love seeing it guys uh and and it makes me excited for the future for oklahoma because this is big things because it, you can't say that Brent Venables did it by attacking the transfer portal and changing a whole lot of things because this is yeah. almost the exact same roster as last year. There's a couple of dudes gone. Uh, there's there's maybe a, a couple of new wide receivers. Uh, there's there's a couple of new defensive players. But for the most part, he did this with almost the exact same guys, which means this is Brent Venables saying, see what you did? It was wrong. We're fixing it now. Not only that, but you'd see a guy make a play out on the field and you would see him grab a hold of him on the sideline and, hey, come here. And you you see that the attention that they give him, and you you understand the the relationship there. I, I love to see it. I'm really excited. Happy for for Oklahoma and, and good job Texas. You you did play a very good game, uh, and you just came short. And I really think Oklahoma just outmuscled you in that game. Uh, and so it was it was a really fun game. Uh, looking forward to the rematch. I, I am. I'm, I'm already looking forward to it um, because it, it's going to be there. Uh, I'm I'm copping my Big Twelve tickets here as soon as possible. My mom and I are, are planning it out already because uh, it just you you don't see a way that Oklahoma doesn't get there after that win, uh, and if they do, man, that's the most disappointing season. Uh, man, I don't I don't want to think about it. But let's go ahead and go on to the next matchup. We got we got LSU beating Mizzou forty nine to thirty nine. Guys, we weren't wrong on this whenever we called it. Uh, we weren't because Mizzou 
had the game covered. They, they covered the spread, and then there was a last-minute pick six. Uh, LSU, again, where is that defense at, man? Where is that defense? Uh, because yeah. you know, Mizzou, Mizzou had their number all game. They were whooping them. Uh, and, but I do want to step back and say, so as, as much as we can rag on, on LSU and we can, we can talk about how terrible they are, uh, that man, you, you came close. You just lost to Ole Miss because your defense sucks. You let, you let, uh, Florida state hang 40 on you. Uh, you just looking at how bad their defense is. We can sit there and rag on LSU all we want, but you know what? For your team to be coming off a loss, go into halftime losing and to be able to come out, it'd be so much easier for you to lay down and give up. It would be mm-hmm. so much easier. You, yes, you you already you already blew it. What what is there more to gain? So hats off to LSU coming out fighting hard in the second half. And hey, guess what? The defense stepped up and got you a pick six to secure the deal there at the end. So that's that's a plus. And I think seeing that from LSU, good job for that. Uh, and Burns taking taking back that pick six really sealed the deal there. Um, just a tough one. But I, I also think, like we said, I think Missouri is tougher than they're going to get credit for this year. I think Missouri's a, a very good team, and I think they're on the right the right track of a, of a decent little rebuild over there with some of the young talent that they've got over there. Uh, so overall, uh, a, a good good job by LSU for coming out in that second half and winning the game. But Missouri, don't hang your head too low because you're looking good, uh, and you just you just fought very tough against a very tough opponent. Um, but Jeremy, what do you have on the, that LSU-Missouri game? That was definitely a scare for up until the second half, just because when I was kept seeing score notifications pop up, LSU not scoring and producing touchdowns, I'm thinking, man, Mizzou, like we already talked about Mizzou being this underrated team and they can sneak up on you, but I don't think a lot of people were expecting Mizzou to put up that many points going into halftime, but of course, typical LSU coming back. I think they probably heard you a little bit saying that their defense sucks, so they actually decided to play football a little bit. Um, but the LSU Tigers, they definitely, they were definitely getting tired of getting curb stomped, so they finally they started finding to lay the wood a little bit. So LSU, they definitely needed to have, um, they definitely needed to have some re recuperating things occur, and make make a better positive thing like their offense and being able to get in the wide open areas and find those gaps and getting getting their offense going. I know their running game, that was definitely a little bit of a struggle and same with their passing game for the first half. But, I mean, you look at what LSU was able to bring to the table after halftime and adjust and find what they can do to put points on the board then. Don't get me wrong. Like I said, they are they came out the win, but I honestly thought Mizzou was definitely going to be rolling with this. So my hat's off to LSU and coming back, but definitely Mizzou, keep your head up. You definitely got a good road ahead of you guys. Keep it playing like this. Yeah, yeah, and the main thing, like I said, Blake, I think for Missouri, you you still got quite a bit of young talent over there that you can really turn this around mm-hmm. and, and make this into a good program. Uh, and I'm I'm happy yes, for Mizzou uh, for at least having that much for him. Yeah, uh, Cook balled out, 395 yards, two yeah. touchdowns. Luther mm. Burden, 11 catches, 150 yards. Um, that Missouri offense is real, man. That Missouri offense is real, and they're much better. Uh, than than I expected this year, and and hats off to Eli Drinkwitz, right? A, a guy that's been criticized a lot in the media, a guy that has taken a lot of heat, saying that he was on the hot seat. Uh, this could be his final run at at uh, Missouri, and uh, you know, tip your cap to him, man. Uh, they went toe to toe with a team that uh, was you know supposed to be an, a national title contender this year, and it's still a really damn good football team. Okay, let's not get that twisted. This offense at LSU is absolutely nasty. Jaden Daniels is one of the best quarterbacks in the country. All right, mm-hmm. uh, he has to put he has to put that he has to put that team on his back. All right, right now it it reminds me a lot of what Johnny Manziel had to do at A and M. All right, it reminds me a lot of that that second season Johnny had at A and M where they had absolutely no defense and Johnny mm-hmm. had to score sixty every Saturday. Uh, Jaden mm-hmm. Daniels, welcome to the same boat, brother. Uh, because that's one thing I grew up on, man, was LSU always having a great run defense, and it's not there this year. They're getting they're getting just blown blown smooth out of the trenches. All right, um, they can't cover. Their secondary is absolute cheeks. Uh, they're just not. They don't tackle good in in open space. 
They, I mean, I, I'm serious, fellas. Like, this isn't an, an LSU defense uh, that that I'm used to, that I'm accustomed to. It's not. Like, it's just not what they've been in the past, right? And um, sorry if you hear my son going <laughs> off. It's all good, bro. It's all good. You're good, bud. Uh, uh, you got daddy duty. Yeah, man. But, uh, you know, Jaden Daniels and, and the Diggs kid at running back, man, he's a bright spot because I really feel like that's one of the things I needed to see LSU do uh, as the year went on was establish the run game, man. That is another thing I grew up on with LSU football is LSU always had a hard-nosed run game, and we haven't seen that. We didn't see it last year, and we haven't seen it this year. But Saturday they found something. And so uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a heck of a game. All right, back and forth, uh, an 11 a.m. kick, one of those games that, you know, you had to split screen the Red River rivalry and, and you had to get LSU and Mizzou up there. No, I, uh, I it tried was, doing uh, that, man, but then it was just, you know, it was it was frustrating me because I kept on – I put up a, a split screen and then I was like, nope, I got to go back to it. It's, this is way too stressful. Go I can't back. distractions. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not <laughs> expecting you to split screen anything because no, with no, all the no. I'm not the, split. The kids screaming. in the no. back heard me screaming. I was man, I, I was trying so hard not to not to lose my cool all all day because like kids back there. I don't care. You guys be kids, all right. In all reality, you're allowed to play back there. You're on the video game back behind behind me in my, my dad's man cave. It's totally cool. But then once you make a little bit of noise or step in front of the screen, I just want to kick you. But no, I I, I love them. And, uh, I'm, I'm glad. Josh, I'm surprised you didn't have a camera on yourself and the TV going. I we, thought we, we were talked about get that. that. We talked going. about reviewing, uh, you know, like setting up a camera and, and recording me watching the game the whole time yeah. and then making little clips of it. You you would have seen me just over there just having a conundrum. I, I was super quiet the whole game, though, because I was super happy, but I was super stressed. Uh, and then, like, on top of that, guys, I didn't even have, like, I think all weekend I only had like two adult beverages because uh, I just I didn't I didn't need it. I, I was happy. I was good. It was it was a smooth. I thought, man, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna get carried away if we lose this game and just blow it. You know, it's gonna yeah. man because you you want to win that game. But no, back to the LSU game. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and and I do think this was a very good response for LSU. Not only like I said, not only losing last week, but then turning around, uh, losing at halftime and still turning it around. So great job to LSU, but also a great job to Mizzou. That was not a bad loss because, like I said, you covered the spread. In all reality, you covered the spread. Brady Cook, you, you threw two interceptions, I think it was. Uh, you got to clean that up. But outside of that, a, f- a great game by Mizzou. And so, like I said, you got a lot of rebuilding to do. Let's jump on to the third matchup, though. We got Alabama, Texas A&M, one that I was able to catch. And one that, let, let me be honest with you guys, where where was the one more field goal? Where was the one more point? Because I had it at forty six and a half, and we sat there at forty six. Man, I needed the I needed the over to hit, man. Uh, no, but honestly, you watch this game, and to see how this game rolled out, uh, to see Max Johnson come in and really ball out, and, and and I didn't expect any less from him. I didn't expect him to come out and and shy away from the big moment because he's used to this. And this is something I think Crane and Company hats off to those guys, uh, and and shout out to them because uh, they talked about this all week. I, I always got to tune in to Crane and Company and, and see what they got going on each week. Uh, but they, they talked about this game and they talked about Max Johnson. Don't think he's gonna he's gonna shy away from the moment because he's he was a starter last year. Let's not forget that he he is he is still a, a good quarterback. And Texas A&M is lucky to have him as a backup, and he showed up. He did he played a very good game. But Jalen Milrow, man. Uh, that dude had a game. Uh, he mm-hmm. finally clicked. He finally had a game against a pretty good defense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Texas A&M has not been not been terrible on defense this year. Uh, and so the fact that Jalen Milrow had this kind of a game with over 300 yards passing uh, and put three touchdowns in through the air had a very good game. Uh, so overall, just looking at this this Alabama team, it finally felt like an Alabama team that's turned the corner and, and found a rhythm. And it finally feels like an Alabama team that's dangerous, uh, and and I just didn't feel that the first four weeks, you know, even even the first five weeks, uh, you just didn't feel that. And so in week six, you finally feel that from from Alabama. I feel like Alabama came out and it looked like Alabama again. Uh, but I mean, Blake, I, I'm sure you probably watched every bit of this game, uh, trying to root on your Aggies, but they they weren't <laughs> able to pull it off. But a, a good game on both sides, uh, and it just. Alabama was the tougher team. They were the better team on on Saturday. 
Yeah, Josh, uh, let's highlight first Jalen Milrow and and uh, Jermaine Burton, right? What a Absolutely. connection they have found. It looks like Jermaine Burton is his go-to guy uh, from here on out. Yeah, I know Bond, <laughs> yeah, uh, Isaiah Bond had a couple nice catches and everything, but Jermaine Burton just absolutely torched this secondary. Uh, and and good, good for him for finally uh, coming over from Georgia last year. Uh, things just kind of never really got going last year for him. But this year he's hitting his stride uh, with Jalen Milrow. And Jalen Milrow still has some things to clean up, man. There's still some things to clean up uh, in the short to intermediate passing game. But that deep ball is a thing of beauty, man. That deep ball is a thing mm-hmm. of beauty. Um, and, and the guy throws d- dipping dots, I mean, down the field. So the biggest thing in this game for me was the second half adjustments for Alabama – uh, on the defensive front, all right. Alabama found a way to attack A and M's O line, which is one of the worst in the SEC, right? Um, and Dallas Turner had himself a game, and that is the one guy that they needed to show up. They they're going to need him for the rest of the year, especially when they go on this little stretch uh, through these next four or maybe five games. Uh, but A and M couldn't they couldn't block this Alabama front and Max Johnson was steadily under pressure. You could see man on majority of his throws, he was backpedaling and, and letting it go. Couldn't, couldn't step into any throws. Uh, and th- that was the difference because on the other side, Alabama's offensive line, they, in the second half, they pretty much protected Jalen Milrow. And uh, it, it's, it's been a lot better. It was a lot better than we've seen, uh, earlier in the year, especially that Texas game that we always like to highlight. So that was the biggest thing for me was the adjustments made at half from this Alabama staff. And I thought Tommy Reese called a pretty dang good game for Alabama because I know he's been under a lot of scrutiny uh, with that Alabama offensive coordinator position. But I thought he called a pretty dang good game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and and Jeremy, the thing with Alabama in this game is that they didn't even use Jalen Milrow the way you expect him to. Uh, and and hats off to them for for switching it up that way. But also hats off to, to Jalen Milrow again for for being able to to find your rhythm in the passing game. And that's what he needed. Uh, it, it was never the the question about his legs. He didn't have to use his legs. And I think that's the part, uh, Jeremy, that that I think was most impressive about their win. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Josh, you and I have talked a little bit about this before, and then you've brought it up. If you want Jalen Milrow to perform like how he should, let Jalen Milrow play like he does. If you, like, you can obviously see for this. J- if he doesn't get pressure, or even just in general, Jalen Milrow, he can drop dimes. And Jalen Milrow, he's a he's a great quarterback with, with some learning to do. But still, for the overall aspect of him, he's got – He's got talent, to say the least. And looking at this Alabama team now, like Blake, you said the best, the adjustments that they made after halftime, that was a really, really big thing for Alabama. And Texas A&M, don't get me wrong, but I had some I had some high hopes for Texas A&M leading up to it, but I was always telling myself, okay, now Alabama's going to adjust or any – top dominant team like what we usually see they're going to adjust and then they're going to see them coming out of the end of the game but obviously sometimes we don't see that come out but texas a&m their their line was definitely atrocious to say the least for what i what i thought to say but i'm glad to see alabama's definitely coming back and look like old school alabama saving nick saban a little bit for um less less headaches to say the least and have some trust in your quarterback and just let him do his thing and you can see this kind of you can see this kind of production that he can bring to the table. Yeah, mainly the defensive adjustments. They looked the, the Alabama uh, mm-hmm. defense looked good in the first quarter. Second quarter, it looked like Texas A&M had their number. It was tough. Uh, and, and like you yeah. said, like I think they that front seven just killed the the Alabama offensive line. Mm-hmm. Uh, they yeah. they figured that out, and then the defense really figured it out for Dal- for Alabama in the second half to really stop them. Uh, and, and just a really good adjustments all around. But let's go on to the next game, next matchup, and. Guys, we're going to get to our power rankings here in a minute. Do any of us not have Georgia at number one? Uh, I have them at number one. Yeah, I, I, so You'd be silly I, if you didn't have them at number one. I, I heard so many people trying to cut down this Georgia team. And, and Blake, you called it. They were going to win them. They were going to win it big. 
Uh, you even said, take them at 45. I don't care. Whatever the spreads, whatever you want to set that spread at. I was unsure because stats don't lie. Jo- uh, Georgia was not very good against the, the run. Uh, and so that that worried me a little bit. I knew they would fix some things. I knew they weren't going to let them run all over them the way that Kentucky ran all over Florida. But look back to last week. Kentucky ran over 350 yards on Florida. Now, I, like I said, I didn't expect them to get even half of that on Georgia. And we know that Georgia, it, Kirby Smart's going to fix the defense. We know that he's going to fix and improve from week to week. But who would have called... Kentucky only running 55 yards on this Georgia defense that has been struggling against the run because I, I wouldn't have called that. Uh, I would have I would have called for maybe only 112 yards, maybe 85 yards, 55 mm-hmm. yards rushing. You didn't allow them to mm-hmm. reach the 100-yard mark, barely let them pass the, the halfway to 100-yard mark. Uh, Brock Bowers' name didn't even hardly get called in this game. That's what was amazing. Yeah. Carson Beck, we talked about him. He showed up and started showing his rhythm against Auburn. He showed up in this in this uh, Georgia game. You you look at what Carson Beck did. I mean, the dude was was phenomenal. He looked like a very good quarterback, and he looked like he finally found his rhythm. And it wasn't with just Brock Bowers. We we talked about Kentucky. What do you have to do to win this game? You're gonna have to shut down Brock Bowers. I don't think they really shut him down. I just think they that that. Carson Beck found other dudes to go to. Uh, the dude threw 389 yards and four touchdowns. Just a phenomenal game. It looked really good. I mean, Brock Bowers did have good numbers. I'm not going to lie. He put up over 130 yards, I think. Um, but he, he didn't get called nearly as much as you would expect with Carson Beck trying to find his rhythm with that key guy. Uh, and, and just the fact that he was able to find so many different guys, the defense standing tall and not allowing the run game, that's what won it for Georgia. Um, but Jeremy, just a, a huge showing. And are, are, we, are we smelling three Pete? It's looking like we're cooking for a three Pete, if I had to <laughs> say the least. But I mean, Georgia, we all knew they're called the dogs for the reason. The dogs definitely bit Kentucky, to say the least. But. I mean, Kentucky, I was really, really surprised when you pull, when you mentioned that stat, holding them to that many few yardage, to say the least. I was I was baffled by it just because I was thinking it was going to be a little bit better. But once you go against the number one team, you better bring your A game. And clearly, Kentucky, they didn't bring anything. I shouldn't say bring anything. They had their moments. I'll give them that. But – for the overall aspect of the game, we all knew Georgia was just going to steamroll this entire thing. So, yeah, that's, in, that's exactly in my, what they did. In my opinion, in my opinion, it's smelling good in the kitchen like a three peats cooking. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But uh, I mean, Blake, over to you, man. I mean, Georgia, number one. Like I said, you called it. You called it. They didn't just cover the spread; they smashed it, uh, and they looked damn good in the process. <sighs> man, I've been telling people Carson Beck's a dude. All right, uh, I really think that his, his arm talent is just so much better than Stetson Bennett's. And I know he can't take off and run like Stetson could and all of that stuff. And, and I'm not saying Stetson's a, a, you know, he's a two-time national champion, right? But when I look at a guy that can go into the NFL in the future, I look at Carson Beck and I say, hey, this is a, this is a dude. All right? And I don't think he's getting the love that he deserves after winning at Jordan Hare the way he did in that fourth quarter comeback. And then he absolutely dismantles Kentucky. And and everybody was high on Kentucky. I was not. I, I, I kept saying that Kentucky wasn't real. They were frauds. They haven't really played anybody. Florida is not a good team. I don't care if they ran for 300 yards. They're a one-dimensional offense, and Georgia showed you that Saturday night. They were loading up to stop the run. And they were going to make Devin Leary throw the football, and he could not do it. I turned it off after the third drive, all right, because I knew what was about to happen. It's just Georgia is that dominant on defense. Look, I had a guy tell me the other night. I had a guy tell me the other night. He said, Georgia's trash after the Auburn game, all right, Alabama fan. He said, Georgia's trash. They just showed me that they're trash because they could barely beat Auburn, all right. Let me remind you, Carson Beck's first road test in a hostile environment was at Jordan-Hare. 
He aced the test. All right. Did he have a perfect game? No. But he aced the test. You saw a young man grow up right before your eyes inside of Jordan Hare Stadium. Last Saturday night, he aced the test again. And he's going to keep acing these tests because he knows on the other side of the ball, they have a top – look, I don't want to say they're the best defense in the country, but they're the best defense in the country, all right? Uh, Match up against them. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, they're so good, man. Um, It's just a rinse and repeat. And they probably have, you know, Kirby, one of the greatest defensive minds we've seen in college football, right? So – Man, this team, I just look and I don't I don't see a weakness. So it's hard for me to sit here and say that, that they're not going to three-peat because I look around the rest of the country and everybody, you know, I mean, there's yeah, there's a lot of good teams, but can Washington's defense stop Georgia? No. Uh, can Oregon? I don't think so. I mean, um, who at Michigan? I, I just don't – I don't think that's a good matchup for Michigan. I think you would see the same thing that you saw two years ago in the college football playoff. Uh, I, I, no, I, Oklahoma, I do think, I do think like week week one through – you know, I, I guess really we, all, all five of the weeks in the, to begin college football, I think you saw signs of weaknesses from Georgia mm-hmm. in those weeks. But that's the thing. What did they do week in the, in the first year that they won this, you know, two years ago? They, they progressed from week to week. Yep. What did they do last year? They came in as huge underdogs because they lost so much. And what did mm-hmm. they do? They progressed each week. I mean, they started off really strong, and then they, they slowed down. They win the game. They do what mm-hmm. they need, need to do to win today. Mm-hmm. And when mm-hmm. tomorrow comes, they're going to win tomorrow. And when, yep. when the next day comes, yep. they're going to win that day. That's, that's what George is going to do. I, I mean, we shouldn't expect any different. It's just hard to call anybody else right now because we finally saw Georgia say, we're putting an end to this. We're coming out here and we're showing why we are ranked number one. Uh, and, and they did just that, man. Uh, like I said, hats off to you because you, you called it. Uh, I wasn't quite ready to pull the trigger, but I, I wasn't disagreeing with you. You know what I mean? So uh, it was a very good showing by the dogs, finally showing up and showing why they're number one. Let's hurry up and kind of do a little quicker one. I feel like we don't have too much to say on these uh, next two games anyways. Uh, so we'll do a little bit of a, a speed, speed round on these two. But uh, Notre Dame... Losing to Louisville, uh, disappointing loss from Notre Dame. They did not look good, uh, specifically Sam Hartman. What the heck were you doing out there, man? Mm. We talked about Jake Plummer, or uh, Jack Plummer, sorry, uh, and, and and what he needed to do. Don't turn the ball over. We we didn't talk mm-hmm. about Sam Hartman not needing to turn, don't turn the ball over. Yeah. The, the dude came out and threw three interceptions. You can't do that. You can't do that on a, on a road game in Louisville. This was this was not a. I told you guys I thought this one seemed a little fishy, mm-hmm. but I wasn't gonna pull the trigger and say Notre Dame's gonna lose. Uh, sh- shout out to Josh Pate. I was listening to him. He called this one. I thought mm-hmm. Josh, you might be a little crazy for this one, but I like it. I like the gutsy picks. You got to pick upsets. Uh, so why not pick this one in Louisville night game? What what Coach Brom is doing there, man? Uh, it's looking special. Year one, and you're sitting there at six and zero. Oh, Looking like a top dog in the ACC right now, the way that they're playing. Uh, so, guys, watch out for Louisville because if they keep on this path, they're they're winning games. That's all you got to do right now. Find your rhythm. I think they just got a huge a huge momentum boost and a huge confident boost this past week. Uh, Louisville, again, we're gonna say it a lot today, but hats off. Uh, looking great, uh, Jeremy. Sam Hartman just didn't didn't get off the bus like like Blake said he needed to. Sam Hartman didn't even want to get off the bus just because if you were to see something like that, he wouldn't have even gotten he wouldn't have even gone on the bus to leave South Bend. Um, I was definitely shocked to say the least seeing Sam Hartman throwing throw three interceptions. Excuse me, then just seeing Louisville put on the game that they did, I was mind boggled. Louisville they showed up and they shut Notre Dame up and. Um, it's one thing to get a little bit of an advantage, like a three-point lead against teams like Notre Dame, but you come out and get that kind of a final score. My hats are off to you, Louisville, because you keep you keep on the gas like this, and you're gonna keep you're gonna keep a lot of people on your on your radar. Because if you keep progressing like this, 
you're definitely going to want to keep them penciling into your schedule and say, we need to step up against these guys. They ain't no slouch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but like I said, Blake, Sam Hartman just didn't step off the bus. Uh, and if he did, uh, he wasn't on the field because I didn't see him. Guys, this is what happens when you turn the football over on the road in a, in a, in a nice mm-hmm. little environment uh, at night. A team that's confident. Uh, I wasn't high on Louisville. Uh, I didn't think they were going to beat Notre Dame. Uh, but I was also shocked at how Louisville just pounded the football on Notre Dame. Like, I, I didn't expect mm-hmm. to see that. And, uh, yeah, I, I was just uh, – I was very underwhelmed in how unprepared Notre Dame was. They looked like an unprepared football team. Yeah. And uh, they just couldn't get anything going offensively. And this this Louisville team, man, they will hit you. They are fast to the football. Uh, and, and they cover well in the secondary. So, uh, congrats to Louisville, man. You shocked me. Yeah, they, they won the turnover battle 5-1. to one. Uh, Looked phenomenal mm. there. Uh, I mean, they, they won on, on third down con- efficiency. They won on total yards. Time of possession. Uh, I pulled it up just now to look. Uh, they did have more penalties, which kind of kept Notre Dame more in the game, but they won by 13, guys. This was a Notre Dame team that was was – was a six and a half point favorite if I remember correctly. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah, Louisville hats off to you. Uh, very good game. Um, but guys, let's jump on to the last matchup. And like I said, I, w- I want to be pretty quick on this one just because I think there's not too much more to say other than the fact that USC doesn't have a defense. We knew this. We talked about this USC. You, you look atrocious. There's no way USC makes it out without two losses. I don't think they are going to win the pac 12. Uh, they, I, I didn't really ever think they would. I thought they had a good chance. Maybe they show up and, and be more of a bend but don't break. Their defense looks terrible. They went to three overtimes with Arizona. Uh, Blake, I, I don't have anything other to say other than who do you got other than Caleb Williams? He can't play defense for you. Uh, offense doesn't look that great either. Alex Grinch no. should be should be thrown in prison for the for the <laughs> thievery that he's he's getting paid big money as a defensive coach and he sucks they can't cover they're not great up their linebackers are lost it's not it's just not good man like and and you're right alex grinch isn't the guy and i keep saying that lincoln isn't going to be a serious contender until he moves on from that higher and gets away from alex grinch caleb williams if it wasn't for caleb williams i don't know if they would win six games Honestly, uh, yeah, like, I, I agree with you. I agree they're with you. that bad. They're that bad. And and I love Matt Leinart, but he can say, "Oh, we woke up with a dub and all of this stuff. A win's a win." Nah, man. Because when you start playing the Oregon's and the Utah's and the Washingtons, uh, it isn't going to be pretty. And and I don't think they can get any better. Everybody's like, "Oh, well, they can improve." I don't think they can because no, they can't tackle. They're they can't getting tackle. worse. They're getting worse. What's tackling? They're getting worse, uh, and, and it, it they they look they look terrible. Yeah, they're they're missing open field tackles. They can't cover anything. Uh, but honestly, even Caleb Williams didn't have a good day because the, the offensive line wasn't blocking for him. Arizona had their number, Jeremy. Arizona had everything on USC. That was atrocious to say the least. But going back to Arizona, I want to give a little shout out to Noah Fafita for stepping up and and putting up a good game for himself. I mean. I know, obviously, with not having their snor- normal starter, not sh- not being able to likely play, then having him step into the reins, I definitely have to give him a big shout out because he definitely shocked a lot of USC. That Coliseum was pretty dang quiet, and um, but overall, the outcome of the game, it's cool to make it a close game, but you have to really put in a three overtimes. I'm sorry, but you're a better team of that. You need to step up and get the job done sooner than that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I just I, I don't see anything from USC. They they were ranked too high no. to begin with. Um, just a terrible game. And like I said, they're getting worse and worse. They got they got Notre Dame this upcoming week. Yeah, so, I, I believe I believe so. I, I don't know. I mean, Notre Dame's just lost too, so that's not good. That's not special good teams was a disaster too. Yeah, yeah. It just it was the whole game. I, I didn't see one thing that I looked at and I was like, well, hey, that was good. That the offense looks worse and worse each week. Uh, Caleb Williams isn't doing worse. It's just he doesn't have help around him sometimes. His his offensive line is terrible. Yeah, they're horrible. 
yeah, trash. Absolutely. But guys, uh, let's let's jump into our power rankings real quick. But before we do, uh, Jeremy, what's the sponsor for the day? Today's episode is also sponsored by Mahler Bros. We want to do a little good on the golf course, but an often, like we've talked about, it comes in expense, but a feeling good. Mahler Bros has polos that look good and feel fantastic with their lightweight and stretchy material that hugs your body, and you will see in the feel of a cool light breeze just as cool. The polos are guaranteed to make you look better, but I try and tell myself it's going to make me golf better, but I haven't found that out yet. Maybe I haven't found the hidden button to do that. But on a hot summer day on the golf course, there's no polo that you would rather wear than Mahler Bros signature polos. Mahler Bros has a large catalog of polos with designs for those who want to allow design and, and others for those that want to have a suitable and slick looking design. They also have fun t-shirts. I'm not wearing one just because I'm really excited because the Bengals won. But um, they're really comical t-shirts. They're really nice, smooth, and there's a lot of varieties. And they also have, outside of t-shirts and polos, we got hats, tumblers, and so, so much more. And even the one thing that everyone has really been excited for is Mahler Bros Coffee. So I'm telling you guys right now, head over to Rising... Uh, head over to the the website and use the code R A S I N G T O for an exclusive fifty percent off. And I will tell you, like I tell everyone with Big Freak, you will not be disappointed with Mahler Bros. So check over with the website and use the code R I S I N G T O for fifteen percent off on your order. Yeah, absolutely. And again, that is MahlerBros.com, M-A-H-L-E-R-B-R-O-S.com. And you can see that link also down in the description. But guys, power rankings, we've got week six, which means we finally see a little bit of separation. Uh, Blake, I'll start off with you because I know you got to go for daddy duty. Uh, Start off with number 10, work your way up your list and give us your top 10. Uh, I will go at number 10. I have Alabama. Uh, And and yes, yeah, I'm... I believe in Alabama and an honorable like mention going too. right outside of Alabama. I have North Carolina honorable mention. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Drake may and, and Gene Chizik doing wonders with that defense up there for Mac Brown. Uh, but at number 10, I have Alabama. Uh, they're getting better week in and week out. Uh, and that defense is absolutely nasty. So uh, at number nine, I have the Texas Longhorns. Uh, even though they lost, I think they lost to a dang good Oklahoma team. I'm still a believer in the Texas Longhorns. I think they'll rematch um, the Oklahoma Sooners in the Big 12 title game. Uh, At number eight, I have Penn State. Uh, I have Penn State at number eight. I still got to see a little bit more. I still got to see them play Michigan and Ohio State. So I'm not as far up on the ladder as everybody else is right now. Uh, Number seven, I have Ohio State. Uh, I'm just still not a believer in Ohio State right now. I got to see a little bit more. Uh, They were sluggish in that first half against Maryland, Um, but they are improving. But that that Michigan game is just staring at me right now, and I'm just not so sure they can beat Michigan. Uh, And that's on the road in the big house as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It's it's funny, too, because you're you're only up uh, to number seven right now. Ours are are pretty different. Really? Yeah. Um, And (laughs) – at number six, I'm going to go with the Oregon Ducks uh, in a big-time matchup to really prove yourself for me to put you uh, even further up on these boards uh, with Washington. Got to go to Washington this week, so that's a big-time matchup. Uh, at number five, I'm going to go with the Oklahoma Sooners. A uh, heck of a win this past Saturday. Uh, I'm a believer in, in Brett Venables and that defense. I'm a believer in uh, Dylan Gabriel and everything he's doing with his arm and his legs. Um, just such a huge improvement on the defensive side for the Oklahoma Sooners. Uh, at number four, at number four, I'm going to go with the Washington Huskies. Michael Penix Jr., uh, Heisman. I'm going to say he's the Heisman front runner right now, in my opinion. I think the dude is top three quarterback in the country. I think he can absolutely spin it. I am a little worried about their defense. Mm-hmm. We'll see uh, how that fares this Saturday. But right now, uh, I got them at number four. Uh, and then number three, I have the Florida State Seminoles. 
uh, Jordan Travis leading that and the, those big time receivers he's got. Uh, they're really potent it on the offensive side of the ball. Want to see their defense step up and play a little better uh, down the stretch. But uh, number two, I got Michigan. Obviously, I, I think they're right there. Uh, and, and if they don't make the national championship game this year, I think the season is a failure, in my opinion. Uh, but, oh, wow, the Braves, they're rocking. Um, <laughs> but uh, – uh, and obviously at number one is the Georgia Bulldogs. Absolute dominance. I think they're going to three-peat, fellas. Uh, on both sides of the ball, they're they're just getting it done right now. So uh, Carson Beck is growing up. We're getting to see him mature as the season goes on, uh, and it's a magical thing to see. Yeah, like I said, how can you really put anybody other than George up there number one? Uh, no, I, I, mm-hmm. Like I said, it, it's, it's crazy. I didn't think we'd be so much different. I do like that you left USC out of the top ten. I can respect that. Yeah. Yep. I just look at it, and I'm thinking, you're still undefeated. You haven't lost. So I'll, I'll go ahead with mine. Uh, I got USC sitting at, their, sitting there at number 10. I, I just I, I like yours better, though. Uh, if, if I were to redo it, I like that. Uh, I, I don't disagree with you. I just feel like you're undefeated. you you got to be given some credit for uh, for something there. Although, I, honestly, going into three overtimes against Arizona, maybe you shouldn't be at number 10. You're undefeated, so I'm going to give you number 10. Number nine, I got Texas. Uh, like you said, I think Texas still deserves to be up there in the top 10. I think they lost to a, a good – I think Oklahoma showed up and was just a better team. I don't think I don't think Texas played bad. I really don't. Uh, and anyone who, who says that they did, they had bad moments, but I think it was all caused by Oklahoma stepping up and being more aggressive and, and stepping into that, that role. Uh, number eight, I'm putting my Oklahoma Sooners right above Texas at number eight. Uh, they beat Texas. I think they played an A minus game where Texas only played a B plus game. I think that's that was the difference there. Maybe four percent different, uh, and and it just that four percent pushed them over the edge. Uh, and and so personally, I, I don't think Oklahoma quite deserves to be up ahead of everyone else just based on resume so far and what they've done. Although I, I think maybe number five is proper after or after overthinking, uh, you know, rethinking it because Oklahoma is six and zero. Oh, on their record, and they're also six and zero against the spread. That going six games in a row, uh, defeating the spread, that is tough to do. Um, so maybe I'm wrong on putting Oklahoma that low, but I think I'm also doing that for my own mind game. Uh, so that's just <laughs> me. Uh, then no, going up to number seven, I got Penn State. Uh, I think Penn State looks really good. I think their defense has has really impressed me. I think that's why I put them ahead of Oklahoma because I'm looking at matchups head to head. I think Oklahoma can beat anybody in the top ten, uh, especially after this weekend. It's just it, it's tough looking looking at the, these top ten. Um, so I put Penn State at number seven, number six Washington. Their offense looks great. Their their defense is a bend, but they, they are what USC needs to model. Great offense, bend but don't break kind of defense. That's going to help your offense uh, and put your offense on the field more. Uh, and then I'm go- going up to number five. I've got Oregon. I really like what I see over at Oregon. Uh, again, I think their defense. Their defense is even slightly better than Washington, I think. Uh, and then their offense, I don't have to say anything on that. Their offense looks amazing. Uh, looking at what Bucky and Bo, and just everybody on that that offense, just outstanding. Uh, couldn't I, I couldn't be more excited for the Oregon's uh, 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 season right now. They've got a big matchup this weekend. Make sure to tune in on Saturday. Uh, we're going to be talking about that matchup. That is going to be our key matchup. Number four, I put Florida State. Uh, I'm high on Florida State. Um, but I am I am going to put Florida State number four. Number three, I'm going to have Ohio State. I, I, I like what I saw from Ohio State, even though they lost. They came away, and, and they, they took everything that they did bad in the first quarter, first second quarter, and they, they turned it around the first half. They turned it around second half and killed Maryland, uh, and they covered that 20-point spread. Uh, so hats off to them for, for fighting against adversity and coming away with the victory there and a big time victory. And then at number two, Michigan, I still think Michigan looks very good. I think they're, they're doing what they need to do. Uh, and then obviously number one, Georgia, uh, I just, you can't go away from that, but, uh, Blake, I know you got to run. I'll let you, you run, but yeah, boys, uh, ha- had a great time tonight. Love talking ball with y'all. Uh, my son, I got to go give him a bath and, uh, feed him real quick. And, uh, we got to lay down. So, uh, All thank right, y'all for having me, man. Yeah. Have a good one, man. Hey, take it easy, Blake. All right, Jeremy. Uh, and for everyone uh, who is watching or listening, I will have all of this. Uh, I will put a a power rankings graphic on social media too. So make sure to go over and follow us on social media. 
uh, for more. Uh, it's it's going to be a lot of fun to to go through here and, and check it out. Um, but Jeremy, let's go over to yours. Uh, what do you got for Power Five rankings? Uh, or uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the Power Rankings top ten. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, for for my number ten, I had Texas. Just because, obviously, for what we've seen, don't get me wrong, they played a good game against Oklahoma, but they still couldn't bring up bring it up on the dub. But looking outside of number 10, at number 9, I had USC. Take it for granted. They just want to triple overtime and barely squeeze it out, but they still have a lot to go. They definitely need some more blocking and coverage, to say the least. But for my number 8, Blake's probably going to hurt me for this. I have Oregon at number eight just because I know Bo Nix is doing Bo Nix things, but the best thing that I saw so far out of Oregon outside of them being Colorado and Blake will never, if we, if you ask Blake about it, he'll never tell you, he'll never tell you the end about it. But looking at my number seven, I have Penn state. I know Penn state has definitely been playing their good game and they've had a definitely a unbelievable fan base but this upcoming i know it's going to be really really fun for whenever we get to the big big key matchups then my number six i have washington and looking at what they've brought to the table and all their stats it's looking looking really really well for washington and i think they have a really really good rest of the season for their upcoming but for not my number five i had your oklahoma sooners and Oklahoma, this was definitely, like I said, the biggest win so far this season. And you got to keep that momentum going, like I said in previous episodes. Keep the ball rolling. Have a great A game throughout the entire game. Stay positive. Um, my number four, I had Florida State. Florida State has definitely been proving themselves like we, we expected them to and have this great rising of a season and bring it every week in and week out and show what they're truly made of. But my number three, your wife, Josh, is going to love me. Um, I have the Ohio State no, University. No, she's going to hate you because you didn't put them at number one, man. Well, at least I brought them in the top five. I, I got to give her that. Um, but no, Ohio State, they can they can be trailing a good amount, then they can come back. Obviously, we've talked about Marvin Harrison Jr. and what they're able to bring to the table. Literally, just give him the ball, and he can put points on the board, to say the least. But, of course, I'm going to be the third guy, and we all have the exact same thing. My number two, Michigan, and my number one, <laughs> Kitchen smelling pretty good for a three P for them dogs, baby. So that's my top ten for the power rankings. But um, it's definitely going to be a fun season for what we still have left. So anything's possible. But let's let's see what happens. Yeah, we still have uh, you know another six games for most teams. Uh, you know some, mm-hmm. some teams a little more. But you know we're yep. we're basically halfway through the season. Um, but like I said, I'm going to put all these out on social media so you guys can see them. If you're just listening on Apple Podcast, or if you want to re-see what we had put up for our top tens, but this is our top tens. And and what's what's funny is I think uh, you and I had the exact same top four. Uh, and then looking at it too, I mean, I was the only one that didn't put Oklahoma as high as they are. But that's that's yeah, I'm that's really I, weird. I, I, I don't want the I don't want the talk because you know what. Uh, just like R.J. Young has been saying, you guys don't want to talk about Oklahoma. You guys don't want to say Oklahoma hasn't played anybody, and I love that. I love the underdog mentality because an underdog is a dog that's starving. He's going to eat uh, like, like like Jason Kelsey says. So, Like yeah. you keep saying, Josh, keep them receipts. Yeah, yeah, well, and I am. Uh, I'll be keeping those receipts. Um, but is that I think that's pretty the best, cool? way, best way to call it out. But uh, let's jump over to some NFL recap just to kind of make this a little speedy. Uh, Jeremy, pick out one of the games that you really want to highlight uh, for this this past weekend. What, what was your top game this weekend? My top game this weekend, um, I'm not trying to be a little bit biased, but I think I'm going to talk oh, about man. what's on my jersey right now. Um, Jamar Chase pulling out the show against the Arizona Cardinals. I know – Cincinnati, we didn't get the ball. We got the ball rolling right from the get-go a little bit. Opening drive, got a touchdown. That was fantastic. But looking at Arizona, they definitely could keep their momentum rolling as well. But their big thing was getting the penalties and 
having some turnovers that were really big for Cincinnati or covering the ball. Then, like I said earlier, Jamar Chase balling out, baby, having a setting a new Cincinnati Bengals single game re- receiving record for having 15 catches out of 19, I believe, if I remember right. Then having over 180, I think it was close to 190 yards, if I had to, if I could remember right. 192. But, between, yeah, 182. I was going to say, I knew it was between 180 and 190. Oh, it was right, 192. Okay, excuse yeah. me. But, like, between that and having Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase getting that click again, I think this is definitely going to be the big rise for Cincinnati just because I know, obviously, we were really hoping we weren't going to be in that one and four situation. Like, they kept talking about this is all in and we have to bring our A game. And guess what? Cincinnati brought their A game. Jamar Chase balled out. Then not having T. Higgins. Then having um, number 16. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on his name. But um, uh, overall, that, it was a really great Irwin? game for Cincinnati. Yeah, Tra- yeah, Trevor Irwin, I think. Yeah. But um, overall, great game for Cincinnati. That was my big highlight key game of the week. What about you, Josh? Yeah, and, and it was getting to the point, too, where you know, you're know you starting off one and three. This is scary for for the Bengals, uh, mm-hmm. Joe Burrow were able to put up over 300 yards, three touchdowns, mm-hmm. but then Jamar Chase with the hat trick. Uh, and, you know, it, this this isn't the game I'm going to pull out, but I will say uh, in a, another hat trick in the NFL last night, the, the uh, Sunday night football game, Travis, or uh, sorry, not Travis Kelsey, uh, George, George Kittle. Kittle. I, I don't know why his, the, the names get so, so mixed up in my head because they're so similar and just, mm-hmm. you know, they're both very emphatic. They're both very... Uh, out the electricity there and, and, between those yeah, two is crazy. They're, they're, they're both great people, and, and they're both guys that are just so hard to hate. Uh, as much as you hate them, you still love them, you know, and they're, they're, they're those kind of guys. Love to watch them. But mm-hmm. George Kittle, uh, a hat trick there. He had a hat trick. The Niners, man, the Niners look uh, – we'll, we'll get to it in a, in a second. They look like they might be the top dogs in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Uh, they looked very good against the Cowgirls. Uh, and Dak Prescott, man – garbage absolute garbage mm, uh dumpster and, fire and also christian mccaffrey like i said this wasn't gonna be my you know I'll, I'll make it this is my game of the week um because i was very impressed by the 49ers i thought this was gonna be a, a tough game the cowboys looked decent all season long i don't think they looked as good as everyone was hyping them up to be i wasn't in on the hype uh i didn't i didn't think that the hype was worth it because this is what the cowboys do every year they, they come out strong. Mm-hmm. They look like they're a tough team. And, and they, they fold under pressure. And that's it, exactly what we saw. Everyone was talking about, oh, Dak Prescott, they switched up passing schemes, and he's looking so much better. He's not turning the ball over. Give it time. Give it time. They lost to the Cardinals because they looked atrocious. Uh, and then now they come out and they, they got killed. Uh, what was it, 42 to 14, something like that? 42 um, to 14, I think. So, I mean, just just looking at that, that overall score. And what surprises me is – Brock Purdy, it's still a shock to me that he's still this good. He hasn't lost a regular season game since he played at Iowa State. Nope. That, that's how good this dude is. Uh, it just he, he really is. He's, he's a phenomenal quarterback. I saw the talent at Iowa State. I know he's good, but the, the dude just, he went off. Uh, he, he looked really efficient, really good. He went 17-24, uh, to 24, 252 yards and four touchdowns. Uh, and then you know just everything everything else around that just clicked uh, and and when you you look at the overall box score too especially in the in the run game the offensive line just pushes everyone around you got Trent Williams and other big dudes up there that just push guys around and, and George Kittle he's aggressive man uh, but you you had really three guys that really split the split the the run game. Uh, Debo Samuel a little bit. He had five carries, but he went for thirty yards. And then of course yeah. Christian McCaffrey doing what he needs to do, uh, and he got fifty one yards. Didn't really have the greatest run run game with Christian McCaffrey. He he was phenomenal in the the pass game. Uh, but and and just what he does best is get out there and just be an extra distra- distraction. But then Jordan Mason coming in and looking really good with six point nine yard average. Uh, so because yeah. he he had ten carries for sixty nine yards, so just the 49ers looking really tough. Um, but to get away from the, from the, the the that game, I think the game that I wanted to pull up was the Jaguars Bills playing over in London. Uh, I'm confused why is is Jacksonville just moving across seas because this is two weeks in a row, isn't it? I guess. Yeah, <laughs> this is two weeks in a row. A very fun game because it was a game where both teams showed up. Both teams looked really good, but but what stood out to me was the Jacksonville 
defense standing up and, and not allowing any run game to really get going. Uh, the, the, the lead rusher was Josh Allen. He only had 14 yards. Just yeah. looking at that, I mean, Josh Allen had a game. He had a game. He, he threw for 359 yards, had two touchdowns through the air, uh, and then one on the ground. So three total touchdowns on the day. He looked really good, but Calvin Ridley finally stepping into the role that we expected to see him step into, and Trevor Lawrence having a phenomenal game, throwing for 300 yards and a touchdown. Uh, but then ETN, uh, see, seeing Travis ETN step in and have the kind of game that he had. Uh, he had 26 carries, 136 yards, two touchdowns. Jackson feels looking very good. Uh, and so seeing Jacksonville have this kind of a game, they really surprised me on how well they played, especially on defense. But then Trevor Lawrence proving the haters wrong and stepping in there. I'm not a bust. I'm not a bust. I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna play my game and keep on progressing. And that's exactly what he's been doing with his entire, uh, his entire career so far. Um, did you have another game you wanted to bring up there in the NFL as we're recapping? I mean, you kind of took my one for the um, for the Dallas San Francisco one, but really, I want to add one thing to it, people. If you really don't, if you really think about Dallas, go ask Stephen A. Smith what his opinion <laughs> is on it. Dallas. That's I oh, I, that's the thing I love. I live for on Monday morning whenever I wake up. That's the first thing I do is pull out my phone, go to Instagram, and just see see Stephen A. Smith just laughing and roasting that Dak Prescott. Well, and and you can hate uh, Stephen A. all you want, and I used to be in that boat, but he, until here recently, I've been seeing him in other interviews outside uh, of his own shows and stuff like that. I think he, I mean, I genuinely believe he's being authentic, and that's that's what kind of amazes yeah. me is that he just he just likes to troll people. He likes to have fun. He throws takes out just just to have a fun take out there. And, and go ahead, yeah. be you, man. Uh, and I, I, I'm appreciating Stephen A. more and more. I think I brought that up on the show in the past. Yeah, and even the same thing with like um, um, Pat McAfee. I mean, you look at all the times on College Game Day. Look at all the hype that he's bringing. And then he's gonna go throw a complete monkey wrench for everything. You see, uh, who was it that we everyone predicted that he was gonna pick, and then all of a sudden he flipped the script and picked the exact opposite. Um, uh, I know it was on a college game day. I feel um, like he does that almost every week, so I'm not sure. Yeah, but, that's yeah, true. I mean, so he's, he's another guy. He he annoys me sometimes. I we we switched over to try to get the broadcast working because ESPN sucks, and I couldn't stand having yeah. Pat McAfee talk about the game. Dude, just leave my game alone. I just need I, I need to hear Kirk Herbstreit calling the game with uh, Chris Fowler and call it that. Um, but how about how about Nathaniel Hackett? Let's bring him up real quick. Having your revenge game against against the Broncos and putting up over 400 yards offense on them, uh, and and awesome. Brees Hall having a day, uh, he looked really good. Uh, I had him with 50 plus yards in the game, and I think he had that on one of his big runs. Uh, so just Nathaniel Hackett, props to you, man. Good job, and and I'm proud yeah. of you for being able to stand up to Sean Payton and, and just shoving it in his face. Um, Russell Wilson, though, dude. <sighs> I don't know what's happening. I don't. I, I don't know what's what's happened with him. Sean Payton, you need to grab him by the collar and get in his face and tell him, I am the captain now. You listen to me. I am the captain now. Uh, that's, that's, I don't, I don't, he, you see Sean Payton address him and go up to him and, and yell at him and Russell Wilson just walks away and he lets him. No, you're the head coach. Treat it like you would a college football team because that's the way you're going to have to p- turn this program around. Uh, Man, the Broncos, they look terrible Josh, yet again. You want to know what my honest opinion of Russell Wilson is? I'm not saying it's because my friend Carson just got here. Russell Wilson, trash. I'm saying Absolutely it right from garbage. then there. Like, you could see him perform, and then all of a sudden, after halftime, you would see most teams adjust, make better, make better, um, make better plays. What's Russell Wilson do? Make the exact opposite. Like, well, yeah, like he the, has the his fumble moments. that he had in the backfield. Like, it was all on him. Oh, my was Stripped out of his hands. Just terrible. No. Man. Like, at this it was point, put, uh, do, they, do they still? No, they don't even have Drew Luck. I, I, I don't know no. who the, the backup quarterback is right now, but just put the guy in, whoever it is. Whoever he is, please put, for yeah, the love just, of God, put him in. Just mm-hmm. terrible. Uh, let, let's jump over to Eagles real quick. Eagles looking really good. The, the only other team mm-hmm. other than the 49ers that are sitting at 5 and 0 right now. Undefeated looked mm-hmm. really good against against the, the Rams. I thought the Rams would be able to score more. I thought this would be more of a shootout looking game. Um, but the Rams also looked good on defense. So both sides on defense, I think I think they both looked pretty pretty solid. Uh, you know, whenever you're keeping yeah. 
I feel like in today's today's world, if you're able to keep somebody under 25 points on defense, you're doing pretty good. You're doing Too something well. right. Uh, but Jalen Hurts doing what Jalen Hurts does best, running the ball well, passing the ball well, over 300 yards, finding A.J. Brown and getting that connection back. Mm. Much, much like what we talked about with Joe Burrow, uh, A.J. Brown being able, being able to rack in six receptions, 127 yards. Phenomenal game there, uh, and, and the, the connection was there. But Matthew Stafford, on the other hand, him and him and Cooper Cup also had a good connection. Uh, Got to give them a little bit of a shout-out because I think they played a good game against a very tough opponent. Um, but ultimately, that that Eagles defense standing up and doing what they, they need to do uh, to keep the, the game a low-scoring game. Uh, and the Eagles pull out 23-14. to 14. Uh, I, w- I was really happy with, with the way that that turned out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you get... You go against Philadelphia in general, whether it's on the offensive side or the defensive side of the ball, you're in for a shootout, to say the least. Look, Philadelphia's defense between Cox and I can't remember the other big guy's name, but, I mean, um, they're absolutely weapons, to say the least, for their defense. And even looking like you mentioned, obviously, on the offensive side of the ball, obviously with Jalen Hurts doing his multi-talent, whether it's his arm, whether it's running with his legs, then – AJ AJ Brown is a dog to say the least. He can find that open seam and he can make it. He can make a little play turn to a big money play and score and put points on the board. But even like you said on the other side of the ball for Matthew Stafford, that was a big blessing for the Rams having Cooper Cup back in the lineup because obviously you can tell right from the get go Matthew Stafford was going right to Cooper Cup and he was in for it and making sure that he was feeling every everything that he wanted to get to him. But, like, this overall game, that was a really, really fun game to watch. I mean, the score doesn't say much, but, I mean, still, between two good teams, I mean, you got, like I said, Matthew Stafford, who who gets a lot of bad rep. But, I mean, Matthew Stafford definitely can put a lot of hurt on you if you're not if you're not playing your cards right. Then, obviously, Jalen Hurts, Jalen Hurts doing Jalen Hurts things, whether it's, like I said, throwing money balls or using his legs or even the, even the booty push. I mean – I've never seen a de- I've never seen an offense have such an equivalent equivalent um, what's the word I want to look for equivalent stat to even on their fourth and one drives to get that extra yard to get the first down. I've never seen a team outside of when they were talking about Tom Brady will be due. Um, they were literally doing everything that they can just to try and hold them down. But Philadelphia being Philadelphia and just just showing why they're undefeated and that they should be able to make a room for a Super Bowl again. Yeah, and, and it, Jeremy, you and I talked about this. Uh, for everyone who didn't get to watch it, you can go back and watch it if you want. We took the the odds for, for both sides, made a bracket out of it, and we put the whole bracket against each other. And we kind of made our own bracket for the Super Bowl, just predicting what, what the, uh, the playoffs would look like. The playoffs are going to look a lot mm-hmm. different. Uh, so I think the Jets are one of the teams that I look at that I'm thinking – they're probably not going to be up there. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, there's still a lot of season left, but I don't think they're going to be up there. There's a few teams in there, probably not going to be in the in the playoffs. But it was more or less just, yeah. hey, let's project it as if this were the standings, and here you go. And we talked about it. Man, this just feels like a repeat to last year. We, we, we see the top dogs going against each other. Uh, right now, who are your top dogs? If you have to look through, let's, let's start off with the NFC and start over there. Uh, who are your top dogs over in the N- NFC right now? I think this one's pretty obvious. Yeah, I, I uh, Josh, I think we can probably skip to the skip to the subject, but I think Philadelphia Eagles, for to say the least. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, and we we talked about this too. It just feels like a repeat because you look at the NFC mm-hmm. right now. There's only two undefeated teams, and they're both in the NFC, uh, and that is the 49ers and the Eagles. And it just doesn't look like there's any way we're gonna see an outcome where it's not these two teams fighting for it in the NFC championship again, just like we saw last mm-hmm. year. Uh, you know, and, and what, what I'm really excited for, uh, I'm trying to see, I don't know what week this is. Let me see if it'll, if it'll pull it up. Uh, we're going to week, week five, this is, but we, we do see. So on, on December 3rd, we're going to see San Francisco go to Philadelphia. That's going to be a Ooh. game that is going to show us a lot of answers. Uh, it's it's going to tell us a lot. I'm really excited for that. Mark your calendars, December 3rd. I mean, obviously, I think that's the, the top two teams over in the NFC. Uh, there's there's no doubt. But then going over to the AFC, a little bit more of a shakeup because your Bengals aren't looking as good as, as we hoped, but we also know that they can turn on the Jets towards the end of the season mm-hmm. and, and make a run for it. Uh, right now, when you're looking at the AFC, who are you thinking is your, your two top dogs right now? Who are, who are your two favorites for the, for the AFC uh, over on that side? 
as much as I wish I could say the Cincinnati Bengals, but like you said, there's a lot of season left. Anything's possible. But outside of that, all the Swifties would be upset if I didn't have to say it. Kansas City, of course. Um, I'm Like I said, I'm not saying that just so I don't have a 80,000 DMs in my Instagram. But um, outside of 80, them. 80,000 subscribers yet, dude. You're jumping ahead of yourself. I don't have I don't even have 80,000 friends. Come on. Give me a break. I really have eight. I don't even have um, eight friends. <laughs> okay. But, um, between the AFC, like I said, between Kansas City and um, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank. Um, 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 I'm just going to say AFC for Kansas City or Cincinnati. If I'm, I'm being optimistic with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I I definitely see a scenario. I, I think Cincinnati's going to make a run for it. I think they're going to make it to the playoffs. I, I'm not that yeah. down on them. I think they're turning things around. I think this this week showed that. Yeah. Uh, they played okay, no but they also played against the Cardinals. Then. So let's slow down yeah. a little bit, but uh, we could see it. But ultimately, I'm looking over at the, the AFC right now, and of course the Dolphins are looking tough. I just don't see them sustaining this offensive no. firepower to be able to keep on winning the way that they are. Uh, you're going to have to have a little bit better defense. Um, and then Buffalo's been showing signs of weaknesses, uh, and, and I'm not super high on them. Right now, I'm looking at Jacksonville. I think Jacksonville's sitting there. They're yeah. sitting there at 3-2. and two. They're turning things around, and I really like the way that Jacksonville looks. Uh, Blake and I talked about Jacksonville in the beginning of the season. Uh, so personally, I'm, I'm looking at, at, I think, Kansas City. They just find a way to win. They do. They just find a way to win. They don't look good right now. They really don't. And, and they haven't looked yeah. good all five weeks. But they're looking good enough to pull movies. out the win, uh, and that's that's all that matters. Um, but that pretty much does it for us. Uh, for everyone watching, if you're watching right now, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you've already hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Uh, if you hit the subscribe button just now, go ahead and you can also hit the like button. We we love your guys' support. We appreciate you guys for doing everything that you have. Um, but then, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. You can hit that five star review. Uh, next episode, I, remind me, Jeremy. I want to jump on and uh, we're going to do a little bit of a, a, a review reading because I want to give people shout outs who are giving us a shout out because I, I just recently looked through and saw some of the reviews that we've had on Apple Podcast, and I really appreciate uh, the kind words that you guys have been throwing out there. Uh, we've been growing in reviews too, so I, I want to thank you guys a lot for for all the support that we've seen over there. That that means a lot to us to be able to see that kind of stuff. So I want to read that, really give you guys good. a shout out back for some of that too. Uh, so tune in uh, the next time we have an episode so I can make sure to do that. Uh, it'll it'll yeah. either be next next Tuesday or next Thursday somewhere in that that uh, that that range. Maybe this upcoming Thursday if we can if we can get everything to schedule out just fine. Uh, but anyways, make sure to follow us on social media. Follow us on Facebook x formerly known as twitter instagram all that fun stuff you can give us all kinds of shout outs over there too we thank you guys so much for all of your support and until next time